Welcome to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger over at SellingYourScreenplay.com. In this episode's main segment, I'm going to be interviewing producer and screenwriter Richard Bato. He's also an entrepreneur and the CEO of Stage 32, which is an online community for all creative types. He's got some real inspiring things to say, as well as some real nuts and bolts information about how to find producers looking for material. So stay tuned for that. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes, or if you're watching this on YouTube, please give it a like and leave a comment. I want to improve this podcast, so some honest, constructive feedback is very much appreciated. Please also share these podcast episodes with anyone who you think could get some value out of them. I got a bunch of nice iTunes reviews this week, so I'd like to thank C. Thulahu, Brian Stump, and FMD Xer. Thanks to you three for giving me some nice comments on iTunes. And over at YouTube, thanks to Ginger Shine and Captain Squint, who left nice comments over there as well. A couple of quick notes. Any websites or links that I mention in the podcast can be found on the blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcasts. This is episode 12, so just look for that. Also, if you want my free guide, How to Sell Your Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address, and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks, along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide, how to write a professional logline and query letter, how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. It really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com com slash guide. A few quick words about what I'm working on. I'm still pushing my various options along. I heard from the director this past week on my sci-fi thriller. He's starting to do some storyboards for it. So I took that as a good sign. My one location sexy thriller screenplay, which I optioned in November is hanging on by a thread. It was just a 90 day option. So it's basically expired, but the producer still seems interested. So I'm not sending it out to anyone else yet. The producer does have a director interested, but I'm not sure how interested he really is. They keep asking me logic questions about the story. So to me, that indicates that the director is not sold on the script yet. She basically has to pay some more money to extend the option. So that's why she's delaying. I suspect if this director backs out, she won't renew the option. I really like the producer, so I'm hoping that she does re-option it. Um, she's got some good credit, so it'd be nice to work with her. So we'll see how that one turns out, hopefully in the next week or so. The other thing I mentioned in the last episode of the podcast is my dark romantic comedy, which I just finished and I'm starting to send out now. I did a blast to my agents and managers list and got a handful of responses, but I haven't heard anything back from any of those yet. I'm going to do a blast to the producers, a producer's blast to the script probably in the next week. So we'll see how that goes. As I mentioned last time too, I have uploaded it to the blacklist site, but I didn't buy a review so far. I got one download, which I think was from the agent manager blast because I put the link in that query letter and the download came right after I did the blast. I'm actually going to be interviewing Franklin Leonard who runs the blacklist site. So keep an eye out for that episode in the next couple of weeks. If you have any questions you want to ask him, please email them to me. I find the site a bit confusing right now, so I have lots of questions myself. Hopefully I can figure it all out because I do think eventually this could be a great resource for screenwriters. He definitely has some really top notch agents and producers on the site. So it's a good way to really get to the sort of the top of the food chain in the screenwriting industry. I got a call from a producer who bought my film noir script last year. I mentioned that on the podcast. He's looking for a low budget family film, few locations that can be shot quickly and easily. I didn't have any, have anything written. So I cooked up an idea and sent it to him. He seemed to like it. So that might turn into something as well. It took a day or two to really hone this idea and come up with a solid log line and short synopsis. I actually have two young daughters. So while I haven't written any family films now, now that I have children, it's something I would like to do. My um, four-year-old watches a ton of Disney movies and, you know, writing something that she could actually watch would, would be a lot of fun. So even if this producer doesn't end up paying me to write this idea, I think I'll probably try and write a family-friendly script as my next spec. 
I had a meet and greet with a producer a couple of weeks ago, too. He read my one location sexy thriller screenplay and liked it enough to bring me in and talk with me. One of the things he said that his company was looking for was easy to shoot sci-fi scripts. He mentioned source code as a great example of the type of film that they really wanted to find. If you haven't seen it yet, you should check it out. He also said he had read the script and saw the, and saw the film and felt like the script was actually better than the film. So I found the script and uploaded it to the Selling Your Screenplay library. Hopefully I'll get a chance to read it in the next couple of weeks. You can find it in the Selling Your Screenplay library at sellingyourscreenplay.com slash library. One of the things he really liked about Source Code was the fact that the characters felt really well developed. And he felt like a lot of the sci-fi thrillers he reads don't have very well developed characters. So this is a good tip. There's a market for limited location, easy to shoot sci-fi thrillers with well developed characters. Another couple of films he mentioned as good examples were a film called Primer, which I haven't seen yet, and a film called Time Crimes, which is a Spanish film. Check those out if you're looking for an interesting film to watch. I just watched Time Crimes and thought it was really excellent. It's it's a really gripping, interesting, you know, really, it could be done on a really low budget. It's a very simple story, very few locations. There's only really three, four actors in the whole thing. So it's a really excellent example of making the most out of um, some really simple locations and, and a small cast. So check that out if you can. So now let's get into the main segment. As I mentioned at the top of the show, Richard Bado is a producer, writer, entrepreneur, and CEO of Stage 32. Here is the interview. Thank you, Richard, for coming on the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. It's great to have you here. Uh, great to be here, Ashley. Always great to talk to you. So maybe you can just give us a little bit of a background on Stage 32 in case some of our listeners haven't heard about it. Just, you know, how did it get started and, and what it um, offers to people today? Sure. Uh, you know, Stage 32 was kind of bred out of a necessity or a need that, you know, I recognized back in probably around 2010, 2011, and it, it kind of stemmed from my own needs as a creative and, and I guess I could say uh, needs and challenges as a creative and as a uh, screenwriter and producer and uh, an actor, um, you know, one of the things I recognize is that there, the networking aspect of the business, uh, in my opinion, as it related to online, was lacking. You know, you didn't have many social media sites that really catered well to um, a creative's needs. You know, I, they're, they're, LinkedIn is, to me, more of a, you know, white-collar kind of, uh, site as far as, you know, wh who it's beneficial for, I guess, is, you know, I could say, and um, Facebook, you know, friends and family. Yeah, Twitter, I'm always Facebook. I'm always hesitant on Facebook. Um, you know, I have had people contact me and try and friend me and stuff. And I'm like, does this person really want to see pictures of my kids, um, you know, as a professional contact? And, and that's the thing. I mean, you know, the, the very little time I spent on Facebook, when I would speak to colleagues in the business, it, it, it would inevitably turn from, you know, business to pictures of their kids or their cats or their dogs. And, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't very productive as far as the business end was concerned. Building personal relationships, sure, but, you know, definitely not for furthering your career or making the contacts necessary, you know, to, to, to get your career to the next level. So, you know, I felt like there was a void there. And uh, I've always also been a big fan and a big, um, you know, proponent of continuing education and uh, that you never stop learning and is, that you never perfect your craft, you just continue to hone it. So my goal very early on was to create a network that, uh, you know, where, where it would be, it would have the social media aspect of it and be a, you know, a... a uh, a social media site for film, television, theater creators, no matter what level you're at, no matter what, uh, how much you've achieved, for people all over the world to connect, to make the world a little bit smaller, to keep connect, people connected 24-7, 365, but then also to bring an educational aspect into the site and to offer classes. Uh, you know, it's easy for people who live in L.A. and New York and maybe London uh, to find acting classes and really good ones, uh -huh. uh, but maybe not so much for people or the people around the world or to find a writing group um, you know, to find that support necessary to further your education as well, 
so we wanted, you know, I wanted that that aspect as you know as part of the site and and make it more than just a social media site, make it an educational hub as well. And and we had to wait until we built up the community to bring that aspect in, but now we're starting to, uh, you know, bring classes and labs and things of that nature into the mm-hmm. site. So that's really where it was bred from, and that was the the sort of impetus behind it. But and then the idea, of course, like I just said, was to you know keep people connected and then and then get them educated and and mm-hmm. offer. Opportunity and uh, well, I, mean, I guess the three key points were connection, opportunity, and uh, the ability to um, make the connections that would take their would keep people in the game. You know, keep mm-hmm. all through the support to keep people in the game. So maybe you can go through sort of um, how you how you see people using the site and maybe some real specifics like you know how can somebody get on there and what they should do i'm sure there's some certain things that are like etiquette you know don't just start spamming people with requests to read your script you know just give us sort of an overview of how a screenwriter even an actor or a producer or director can get on there and use the site effectively sure i mean and and i'm glad you mentioned the spam and and all that you know the whole idea was to create an environment that was overwhelmingly positive and that was sort of a give first take second environment and and i'm really proud to say it's one of the things i'm most proud of about the site is that that is the environment it's overwhelmingly positive we've had to kick very very few people off or warn very few people you know for spamming and for um uh you know abusing sort of the privilege of being able to communicate and network with people all over the world. It's, you know, to go, to step back, it is a free site. It's very, very easy to sign up. There's no membership fees. You just create a profile. Uh, you could upload your screenplays, your log lines, your synopsis, or if you're an actor, your reels, or a director, your reel. Um, and then, you know, it's all about getting out there. You know, I think the biggest mistake that all of us make as creatives is that we spend so much time honing our craft and so little time getting our talents out there, and it's especially true with screenwriters. Screenwriters have the tendency, of course, you know, to, to write a great screenplay, to push it and nudge it along a little bit, and then if they're not getting the response they want, really, then they go back and they write another one. And, so, and that's a huge mistake, because if you feel like you have a good product, you really need to get it out there. But for a lot of screenwriters, the problem is, of course, who do I connect with, who do I network with? Well, on this site, you know, there are managers, there are agents, uh, there are, you know, clearly other writers. And what screenwriters on the site have done, you know, is they, they create writing groups within the site. They share log lines. They share pages. Um, you know, they share, in, you know, total, uh, entire scripts. And they help critique one another. They help one another. And then they go out and they network and they put their, you know, they put their log lines and the synopsis and, and, and the screenplays themselves onto their profile page. And they, and they go out and, and promote that. So we have, within the site, we have the Stage 32 Lounge, and of course the screenwriting section for that. It's one of our actually the most popular sections of the site and, and one that has, you know, the most activity. Because we do have, we have about 50,000 screenwriters on the site right now. Wow. Uh, we also have, you know, novelists who are looking to either adapt their screenplay or finding somebody to adapt, I mean, adapt their novel or finding somebody to adapt the novel. I mean, we have a ton of writers on the site, and they're incredibly creative remarkably active, and as selfless as they come, it's just an incredible, incredibly welcoming and supportive screenwriting community on the site. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm particularly proud of that as a screenwriter because I did feel like that was lacking again online. But, you know, there are some screenwriting boards out there and some other forums out there, but I find that they, they really skew to the negative a lot of the time. Like, you know, things get out of control. Uh, there's There's a lot of you know, sort of bitterness and anger and stuff that could get comes into these forms that I just don't feel is 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 condu- uh, uh, conducive to um, keeping people positive. You know, and keeping people mm-hmm. in the mindset that this is this is a you know an achievable thing that they're trying to do. You know, as creatives, we hear no all the time. That's hard enough. You know, that's enough of a struggle. It knocks a lot of people out of the game. But 
it's much worse if you're involved in a community or an environment where there's so much negativity. So, sure. Again, Let's go back to the lounge just for a second and sort of explain what that is. Is it basically like a Twitter feed where anybody can write a post and then they somehow flag it as being in the lounge? Do you go to the lounge and, and write a post? Just explain sort of what, the, and again, what's the etiquette on that of how do you get involved with something like that? I, I, I'm, I haven't used it, so I'm not sure exactly what it is or what it even looks like or how to physically use it. But then I'd also like to hear just some sort of guidelines. Yeah, it's more it's more forms than I would say a Twitter feed. Um, there are a million topics on there. You can go in, and again, you know, it's sort of as far as the environment is concerned and the etiquette is concerned. What I say is that it's you know it's a give first, take second, uh, you know, sort of environment and mentality that we try to uh-huh. promote. So what we ask you know people to do is you know if they sign up, it's fine to go into the the lounge and say hey you know. I'm looking for a manager, an agent, and, and here's what I have. That's fine. And, you know, solicit feedback and see what, you, you know, see what comes back to you. But we also ask people to go into the lounge and to look at the topics, look at what people have posted, and contribute. Because, mm-hmm. you know, let's face it, most writers have something to contribute. You know, you'll get people sure. that will go in and say, hey, you know, here's my log line. I'm having a problem with it. What do you think? And you'll get 60 responses, people coming in saying, oh, you know, you should try this. What are you doing this? And maybe you're missing this. It goes on all the time, but there's also, I mean, it, it encompasses all things stream writing. So I see. Like the etiquette is just, you know, again, I, not to be repetitive, but the etiquette really, and I think it should be this way, whether you're online or offline, is to be a giver first and a take a second. Uh-huh. Um, but you got to be active. You see, I mean, here's the thing. I mean, you get a lot of people that come onto these sites and, and you know, they stand in the shadows and all they do is read these posts, and, and they don't really participate. And it's a mistake. It really is. It's a huge mistake because, first of all, you're not being visible, and if you're not visible, opportunity is not going to come to you. Second of all, you know, you can't be afraid to ask questions, and that's what you know the lounge is all about: is creating this inviting environment where there are no stupid questions. We're all here to help one another, and we're all here to do, uh, you know, work together. You know, to work together to help each other. You know realize our dreams and that's the environment of the lounge but if you're not active in it you're not going to get anything out of it sure so as far as approaching an agent or a producer on the site i mean if an agent or a producer has signed up for your site what are they actually looking for it it stands to reason that they're looking to meet writers i mean if they're a literary agent and they join stage 32 they're they're looking for writers so how do you approach them what would be um, a good way to connect with them well, you could search throughout the site. You could search by profession. What a lot of writers will do is that they'll, you know, they'll search by producers. Sometimes in their area, sometimes out of their area, because it really, you know, in a lot of ways, it doesn't matter if the producer is in your area. Um, and they'll look for their needs. There's also a fine work section on the site where producers will list their needs if they're looking for a specific screenplay or um, something in a specific genre. Uh, you know, they'll post that. So that's another way to find them. Uh, the producers also have their own lounge uh, area where they'll produce, you know, they'll uh, post what they're looking for. It's all. Are matter, screenwriters um, are screenwriters allowed to go into the producers' lounge and post sure. log lines? Okay. Yeah, you can go anywhere. You can, and you can subscribe to any lounge uh, any lounge category as well. And what I mean by that is, if you subscribe to it, anytime there's a new post in that lounge, you'll get an email on it. If you subscribe, you can also subscribe to an individual topic. Uh, so if you're not necessarily participating in that topic, but you're following it, you'll get an update every time that somebody makes a new post in that uh, in that thread. So you know there's a there's a million ways to connect with producers, to, to you know connect with managers, connect with agents, and you know the the other thing that can't be undersold here is that you know when you make screenwriters in general, and you know this as well as anyone actually, you know a lot of a lot of the success sometimes that a screenwriter will realize is working with other screenwriters and having that screenwriter, having, if I'm working with you, let me put it, I'm kind of getting all over the place here, but let me put it this way. I'm working with you, Ashley. You know some people in the industry. I know some people in the industry. You're reading my script. You're helping me along with my stuff. I'm helping you along with your stuff. You have your contacts. Mm-hmm. I have my contacts. If I feel like there's something that, uh, if I feel like your script fits something that I know a manager is looking for, Obviously, I could pass that along. That's part mm-hmm. of the networking process, and that happens all the time in this business. It's, it's the contacts that you make, sure. sometimes within your own writing group, that lead to the passing along of a script to a manager or producer that has a need. 
Um, that happens all the time on the site as well. Uh, sure, so sure. You, know, you can't underestimate that aspect. A lot of people come into the site and they, they have the blinders on. They come in and they say, well, I got this script. Let me go find a manager or producer. And they kind of go at it full throttle that way. And it's, it's not the greatest approach. You know, what happens mm-hmm. inside the site, and I've heard this many times, especially from managers, because sometimes managers in this business, literary managers in Hollywood and in New York, are inside, you know, stage 32. They have a profile, but they'll list themselves as producers as opposed to managers because they don't want to get, you know, get bombarded. But then what they'll do is they'll go into the screenwriting lounge and look at who's posting what, look who's, you know, look who's being uh, active and who seems to have smarts about the business, you know, people that are helping other people, and then they'll go and look at their profile and they'll look at their log lines and they'll look at what they have posted, and then they'll contact them and say, hey, I want to read that script. So it works sort of, so that's a sort of a reverse engineering kind of thing of how it works in a way where it's, you know, the manager or the producer that pursues the screenwriter, you know, sure. the site. So it's another reason why I always say, you know, be visible, be active, because you just never know, uh, you know, when somebody's going to be looking at your profile or looking what you, at what you're saying or being impressed by what you're saying to look further into what you're doing. Sure. I want to ask one question, and I'm merely playing devil's advocate here because it's not something that I worry about, but I know I get a lot of emails on this topic, so I'll just throw it out to you. Are A lot of writers are worried about uploading a logline or synopsis because they're afraid someone is going to steal their idea. And again, I want to emphasize, every logline I have is publicly available on AshleyMyers.com, so I'm not the least bit worried about anybody stealing my ideas. But how do you deal with that? Is there a way of, of tracking who is actually seeing your log? Line or downloaded your script or, or downloaded your synopsis, um, or can you block certain people or segments? We don't. We don't put. Well, let me let me answer the, the second part of that first. We don't. Uh, unlike LinkedIn, where it's you know who looked at your profile, we don't have that that feature in the site. And the reason that we don't have that feature is uh, my feeling is that it's it's a privacy thing. I I my, I'd rather have. I want everybody to feel secure. Um, in, in that sort of privacy aspect of the site. Oh, and, and I think it's important. You know, as far as who's downloading it or who's looking at it and, and, you know, putting up, worrying about who's looking at it or who's, you know, downloading it or whatever. You know, it's, the, it's, again, it's the whole, it, it's just the whole argument that's gone on since the beginning of time. Like, you know, I'm worried about somebody stealing my ideas. I'm worried about, you have to register your work. I mean, it's the bottom line. You have to register your work with the WGA West and, and the Library of Congress. Double up. Protect yourself. It's worth the investment. It costs under $100 to do both. And at that point, you've got to get your work out there. I mean, I've written screenplays where, you know, I've gotten sometimes off of, a, you know, even just a query uh, blast, you know, 30 to 40 to 50 to 60 requests. And I can't be worried about who's reading it. I can't be worried mm-hmm. about that maybe this is a small production company and who are they passing it on to? Where else is it going? I mean, the uh-huh. idea is to get your work out there. The idea is to get it seen. But you have to protect it. You know, I went to the Austin Film Festival a couple of years ago and I was sitting in a uh, <laughs> in a, uh, a session with uh, Lawrence Kasdan, of course, who's the you know, famous director, writer, and, you know, sure. uh, it Raiders of the Lost Ark and the um, uh, Empire Strikes Back, Body Heat and all that. And, you know, this question gets asked every time you go down to Austin and you go into these screenwriting festivals, this question gets asked in almost every single session, you know, how do I know that my work's not going to get stolen? Lawrence Kasdan sat there and said, can't believe, and I'm quoting this, because I can't believe you're asking me these, this fucking question. He goes, he goes, if you're asking me this question, he goes, you know what? Your work isn't good enough. He goes, because you don't even know enough to register it and to protect it. He goes, and he goes, he said, have you registered and protected it? And the, and the girl said, you know, no, not, you know. And uh, he said, well, he goes, then you're a fool. Mm-hmm. And he didn't mean to be mean, yeah. he was, but he was making a point. It, it's, it's that, we're, you know, we write to get our work, mm-hmm. make, you know, to get, the, to get the work sold or optioned or produced, whatever the heck it is, but you got to get it out there. Yeah, so, yeah. You know, I'm totally on board with that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you so. can't post. I mean, you have to get your log lines up there. You have to put your scripts up there if you want. 
you know, if, if you're that worried about it, put your log line and your synopsis up there. If you don't want to put the whole script, then wait for somebody to come along and, and request it and then do your due diligence on who's requesting it. That's fine as well. But, you know, I even think that's overkill. Register mm-hmm. your work and get the damn thing out there. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree. So are there um, some specific sort of success stories that you could point to on Stage 32? Yeah, I mean, we've had a ton, and they come in by the day. I mean, to stick with sort of the screenwriting ones, very, very recently, oh, yeah, we had two that are just, one that's just fantastic. I'll get to that one in a second, but we just had one this week of a um, a writer in Ireland who uh, has been writing for a really long time, had a couple of shorts produced, but nothing major, and uh, was actually ready to give up the ghost. You know, he's been, he's been writing for, I believe, 15, 17 years and felt that he didn't have the time to write um, any longer because he, you know, he had to put food on the table and his, his job was, mm-hmm. take, you know, was taking up too much of his time, basically. And uh, he felt like he had given it a shot and, and uh, you know, was at the end of it now. And he saw a post from a producer in New York who was looking for... Um, Dramas of all things, because nobody wants to make dramas. That's the uh, the end of myth in Hollywood right now. Maybe the uh-huh. studios, but other people were making them. And uh, he had a family drama and an Irish family drama that he sent along. And uh, this producer looked at, I believe, forty scripts from Stage Thirty Two members. He got forty submissions, and he picked this one, um, put a money option down on it. And he's in the middle of putting the cast and crew together and funds together, and, and it's almost already done. Mm-hmm. And uh, this guy's going to be a paid writer. He's being flown yeah, to Europe next week. And that's, that's fantastic. Then I'll give you another really quick one that I that I, I just think is fascinating. It's one that happened a few months ago. There was a uh, writer in Canada who. Um, well, let me let me back up. There was a producer and filmmaker in India. And he used to work in Hollywood and um, had made quite a few films in Hollywood. And he was putting together a World War II drama. And uh, he had some, he, you know, had a lot of money in. And he was writing, he was having a problem writing the action scenes for the script. They weren't working. It was, a, you know, a pretty long uh, sort of epic film and, you know, about a 150-page script. And he could not get the action scenes down. So he went on to stage 32 made a post about it, asked people to send some writing, uh, you know, some samples of their writing. This writer up in Canada, again, same type of thing, 10-year vet, you know, with uh, or 10-year, I guess you could say 10-year, not so much a veteran, you know, so much as a 10-year uh, struggling writer, you know, somebody, again, who had flown close to the sun a couple of times with a couple of scripts but you know, didn't get them made. And uh, this uh, filmmaker in India, producer in India, picked him to write the battle scenes, Enjoyed the writing so much, he had him do a polish on the rest of the script, made him a co-writer on the script. They hired an actor out of the UK who has uh, voiced some Disney films and has worked in some other Hollywood production, uh, Hollywood uh, productions, as well as some uh, English productions. And uh, they are now in production of this film. They have already secured worldwide distribution on it. And uh, this was another writer that, you know, was kind of you know, at, at the end of it, really, and, you know, and, and down on it. And now he's going to be uh, a co-writer on a uh, feature film. That's great. That's fantastic. So it sounds like both of those were um, a producer going on stage 32 and specifically requesting stuff. Is there an easy way for screenwriters to, you know, get to those specifically to those script requests? Oh, yeah. I mean, because these... You know, again, these these requests will either be posted in, you know, the uh, Stage 32 Lounge or they'll be posted in the Fine Work section. Uh, you know, obviously it's up to, again, it's up to the person, the writer, to be to be logging in every day, mm-hmm. to be active every day, to be checking those sections every day, because um, you never know when they're going to be posted. I mean, you know, it's mm-hmm. constant. There's always new projects being posted and there's always people looking for material. I mean, everybody has a need on that site. Uh-huh. And, you know, a lot of times it's a producer or a director looking for a script. 
Hmm. Yeah, that would be. I wonder if that wouldn't be a tool that you guys could build out, though, that so that you could somehow just like get those script requests. Because I know I get a ton of emails from people that are like, "Hey, should I use Ink Tip? Should I use these other?" And that's you know the service that they provide. And if you had a a facility to somehow pull out just the specific script requests and then send out emails, um, I mean, you could probably charge for that service. But even if you weren't going to charge, um, it would be something that would I think a lot of writers would find useful. Yeah, I think it's a slippery slope. I mean, I think when you start talking about ink tip and the blacklist and things of that nature, I think that they do, you know, they provide a specific service and there are, you know, as been discussed at, you know, at Infinitum, I mean, there, there are positives and negatives to all of them. I think that, you know, we, we do try to make it extremely easy with the fine work section. Like, mm-hmm. for example, you can go in there and you could say, um, you could actually search by screenwriting. So in other words, every single uh, uh, post regarding a need for a screenwriter will come up, and you'll be able to search that way. So it, it, it is pretty easy to do. I understand where you're coming from, and, and it is, it's definitely a little bit of a different model and, uh-huh. you know, something to consider. But again, uh, you know, I, I, think, I think you would agree that all of those services have their positives and their negatives. And, I, you know, I, I don't know if any of them have been completely perfected yet. And, uh, sure. um, but, you know, it, it's, it's an ever-evolving thing. And, and, you know, as we, you know, we've started to provide, we, we started, for example, we've started to do, um, we partnered up with the Happy Writers and, and Joey Tucci over there, who, who does an amazing job of writers. He's been doing online pitch fest for a couple of years. He's helped hundreds of writers secure deals and, and um, uh, find representation, get options, get sold, uh, you know, you name it. And anything that, everything that a screenwriter is hoping to do, he's sort of facilitated through his pitch fest services. And we've, you know, joined forces with him to run Pitch Fest. They're on number 10, which is coming in a couple of weekends, and it's going to have, hmm. I mean, we have the top executives from UTA, WMA, Disney, Fox, um, man, I've got a Paramount Insurge. I mean, there's a bunch of them. And, sure. you know, for the, the, we've done nine so far, and over 20 of the writers have been able to, you know, uh, get, you know, I've, I've landed representation, landed development meetings, secured options, been sold, it's been incredible. I mean, for three months to have 20 writers basically take the next step, it's, you know, it's been incredibly, incredibly rewarding. To me, that's a service that is sort of greater than, you know, a peer service or, um, you know, sort of a matchmaking service that, that may or may not happen. So that's why I think with the fine work section and, you know, being able to hook up producer with screenwriter, uh, director with screenwriter, where there is a specific need and they are actually requesting a script, like I said, in a specific genre or in a specific budget range or whatever, um, I, I feel like that is more of the puzzle pieces are going to come together much easier, cleaner, and quicker that way than maybe through you know, like an ink tip or a blacklist where it's, uh-huh. you know, it, it's being reviewed and it's being looked at in a different way. It's a different model. But yeah. then again, with these pitches, this is a direct Skype pitch face to face with the executive. You're able to sit there. To me, that's much, much more valuable. Mm-hmm. And the, I, I also think that the, there's much more of an instant gratification thing there. And I also think that if something, if you're going to get, success off of it, it's going to come much more quickly because right there on the spot, the executive can then, after hearing your pitch, request your script. So, Uh you know, that's a service that I have much more of an interest in, if that makes Uh any sense. Sure, Um, sure. That's probably a good segue. Um, let's, let's talk about some of the, um, you mentioned that you guys are offering education and classes and some of the other services. Let's talk about a bit about that. Are there any specific classes that are coming up that, um, writers could get in on? Yes, and, and we, we are, uh, you know, we, we introduced over the second half of, or the, maybe I should say the fourth quarter of 2013, we started introducing um, many educational aspects to the site, and one of them was our Next Level webinar series. We've had um, a couple geared towards writers so far. We had one on finding a manager and an agent with Lee Jessup, um, 
who is, you know, one of the top screenwriting consultants out here in Hollywood. She's fantastic. She is going to be teaching a class for us coming up soon. We're going to be announcing that very shortly. Um, it'll be a four-week class uh, that, uh, you know, I just think that will help writers fully understand what they need to do um, to get noticed, you know, to, mm-hmm. to, to hook a producer, to hook a manager. Um, it's going to cover every single aspect of that, including, you know, query letters and synopsis, which I think is, you know, incredibly underserved. It's very, you know, writers, a lot of writers, and I and I do, I certainly do, a lot of writers have a very hard time writing a synopsis and log, mm-hmm. log line. And, you know, it's much easier to write the script than it is to boil it down to one page or a few paragraphs. But it's also going to be a class on, you know, navigating the waters and mm-hmm. how do you get, you know, how do you get noticed? How do you get a leg up kind of thing? Lee has a book Perfect. in a couple of months, which I've read, and it, it's awesome. So she's great for that class. We do have, we have a screenwriting lab that is going to be um, uh, starting in the middle of February. That one was by invite only uh, so far. We had to keep that one small. We're only keeping it to 20 people. Um, but we're going to introduce more of those labs. That one's actually being taught by Garrett Dion, who was one of the producers on Drive and uh, is one of the top guns over at uh, Bold Films. Fantastic teacher, just a great guy. How does a lab? How does a lab work? Just um, like it's me- um, um, one meeting a-, a week for a few months. How does something like that take place? Yeah, the labs are that particular lab is an eight-week lab. And it meets once a week for two hours. And, you know, Garrick instructs and, and gives feedback. It's all done via video. And, um, you know, you, you, there's obviously Q&A sessions at the end of each each class and review every, you know, review of, of the work every week and things of that nature. So it's a very, very hands-on. You you know, you get to communicate with Garrick throughout, you know, via email or, or other methods, which, you know, he provides. And uh, it's it's a, just a very very hands on class, and what's great about it is you can be anywhere in the world and, to take it. And we're going to be introducing a lot more of those. Um, we also have a webinar on sitcom writing, which takes place, uh, I believe, next Wednesday or Thursday. Um, and you know, so we're, we're constantly, and that's one of the goals. We're going to be doing much much more with the Happy Writers. And uh, we'll have a couple of announcements regarding that over the next couple of weeks. I just can't reveal them quite yet. But okay, okay, uh, sure. Is there is there a specific <laughs> um, uh, URL? Is there a specific URL on Stage Thirty Two, like Stage Thirty Two dot com slash classes, that they can go and learn more about these? Yes, if you go on on, on Stage Thirty Two, and this is going to evolve as well over uh, the next few weeks, and you know, it's also part of. Uh, and announcing movie making, we have a, just a whole bunch of things uh, in the pipeline. So, but for the time Can't being, wait. if you go to stage thirty-two and you go under learn, you will on the top menu bar you'll see all the webinars, the other okay. educational uh, items we offer, and then all the pitch fest information is under the top menu bar under creative fest. Okay. And uh, you'll see, you can even go back and see all the ones that we've run in the past and all the executives that we've had in. And I mean, it's just a murderous row of uh, perfect. Topics. I'll 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 link to all of those in the show notes. We can um, put some put the links so people can get to them. Um, so let's take off the CEO cap for a minute and um, just talk about your own writing, um, what you've done, and and the success you've had, and and how you've had that success. Sure. Um, well, you know, I've been writing. Well, I used to edit Razor Magazine, so I was always involved in, in the uh, the writing world. I've always been a writer. I mean, even going all the way back to uh, you know high school and, and beyond, and uh, wanted to write screenplays and, and made that transition uh, after uh, the Razor years. Uh, during the Razor years, I was producing, and I was involved with a uh, film called Another Happy Day a little bit after... Um, a little right after uh, we had shut down Razor, uh, which was a film that went to Sundance in 2011, uh, and I starred uh, Demi Moore and Ellen Barkin, and Ellen, uh, Ellen Bernstein, and Kate Bosworth, et cetera, et cetera. It was uh, directed by Sam Levinson. During that period was when I started to write and was working with some of the producers on that film and some other people that I had met during that process and that 
again, you know, so my networking came into play, people that I had, you know, kind of connected with who connected me to other people during that time. And uh, at one point, you know, we were in, well, I had written a few screenplays, and at one point we were in pre-production on one, on development on one, and, you know, I'd raised a bunch of money, a couple of million dollars, to get a, a film called uh, Rocket Red Blair off the ground, and, uh, you know, we had feelers out to actresses, and it was all going along very, very well, and it was the type of thing where it was a writer's dream because I had, not only was I staying on as a producer, but I had fellow producers who were all totally on board with the, the project, with the writing, and, and mm-hmm. you know, didn't want to change a thing. So it was just a dream, and, uh, you know, we had the whole project together, and, you know, one producer, for lack of a better way of putting it, one producer started playing Who's Thick is Bigger with another producer, and the entire thing fell apart. And it was a tough lesson, huh. and it was one of those things that, you know, happens in this business, and it happens all the time. And, you know, I, I stole this sort of motto or credo, whatever you want to call it, from my cousin who worked in the music business for 30 years, that it's nothing until it's something. And uh-huh. it's uh, and I kind of take that to heart, and I think all creatives should, because, you know, again, it, it's very, very tough to pull a movie together. Mm-hmm. And um, So your movie that... Your movie that went to Sundance, um, how did you raise the money for that? I, I always get questions from writers um, just wondering, hey, I've written a script. I want to try and produce it myself. How should I go about raising the money? Do you have any tips for people who want to raise money to shoot their script? Well, I didn't predict, well that particular one, the one that went to Sundance, I didn't uh, – it wasn't my film. It was Mandalay Vision. It was a much bigger film. It was Mandalay Vision was involved and. Uh, Salim Retre, who was running Mandalay Vision at the time, was who I was working with closely. We all, I mean, if you look at that, that at that movie, you'll see, as as it is with the case for most independent films these days, there's a ton of producers and executive producers on the film. We all had sort of a role in, you know, getting the money in, you know, trying to find some of the last little bits of financing, but also piecing together the puzzles of where to shoot and, and, and how to get this thing done in, in basically five weeks when you had stars of the caliber that I was talking about before working for scale. And that's pretty much what we had. We had you know, mm-hmm. all these actors and actresses working for nothing. So it was a very, very different kind of thing. For Rockets Red Glare, which was my film and which was going to be under my production, ban- my production company banner along with the other producers, we, you know, a couple of the people... Uh, one of the producers that was involved went to his own investors. I went to investors that were involved with Another Happy Day and some other people that I knew had interest in films. I talked to other uh, people I knew that had worked on other various films and got contacts from them. Again, it was a big networking thing. I, you know, I worked the phones constantly and the emails constantly. And, you know, we found people who bought in. We found people who believed in what we were doing, and the and the intent with this film, you know, with Rocket Red Glare, was to take it to Sundance, and we had run mm-hmm. it by, you know, the script by people who, um, you know, uh, make the decisions up there and who are involved in in the decision making, and they were real bullish on the script as well. So it was the type of thing that, uh, you know, the investors understood that we had not only a game plan to get this done and to attract the type of talent that could make this, uh, you know, a high-profile film, um, especially for an independent, you know, especially for a drama and an independent mm-hmm. film. But, you know, that, the, that, the, that there was an end game or a goal with this, you know, to get it into the festivals and especially uh, a high-end goal of getting it into Sundance. So we were able to get a lot of people behind that. And, mm-hmm. you know, if it wasn't for ego and hubris, it probably would have gotten done. Uh, hmm. But that's how we went about getting the money. And specifically, what does that mean? I mean, you you are they were they sophisticated film investors that you had networked with? Was it um, you know rich doctors who wanted to get involved in the film <laughs> industry? What kind of people? It was a combination. I mean, it was people that had um, you know some of the people had been involved with uh, with another happy day. So they been, it wasn't their first rodeo, and quite a few of the people that were involved with Another Happy Day had been involved in other Mandalay films before and other films before. So they were, you know, they were. I guess we, the, I guess you could use the word seasoned a little bit as mm-hmm. far as how the whole process worked. There was no surprises or anything like that. But then we also had, you know, first timers, and we had people mm-hmm. that just wanted to get into the business and, or you know, wanted to get a taste and. 
And, uh, you know, I think that the key to it all, I think the mistake that people make, you know, when they're trying to put their own film together, the biggest mistake they make is they don't, they're not realistic with the budget. They're not savvy on the tax incentives they can get. Um, you know, they, they, they don't, they overshoot. And we were very, very realistic with this budget. You know, we, we were at 3.5 million for the budget and we knew that we could get, we, you know, at that time we were talking about maybe shooting it in Connecticut, which had major tax incentives at the time. If not, maybe in Michigan, uh, there were only a couple of probably external shots that would have had to be shot in New York and that wouldn't have cost a hell of a lot. It, you know, mm -hmm. it wasn't a, a, a huge chunk of the film. And, uh, you know, we had to make the, we had to make the suburbs of Queens in a way, or, or Michigan or Connecticut look like the suburbs of Queens, and we felt that we could do that. And, uh, you know, it's a matter of just knowing, you know, knowing, knowing what you can do, what's, what is the bare minimum? You know, mm -hmm. how do I get this down? What sacrifices do I make? Even within the script itself, you know, if I need to get this done, I can't be too precious about certain scenes. Like, you know, if I, if, you know, if I have this gigantic fireworks, this, you know, show on, on the Hudson, which I had in the movie, you know, in the script, I have to, you know, figure out, is there a way to film that cheap or do we change the scene a little bit or do we change the location? I mean, you just have to, you can't be precious about it. And then once you do all that, you need to have somebody that, you know, is really wise and savvy on putting a budget together and, you know, go in on the low end. And, mm -hmm. you know, you have to put your investors in a, in a spot especially the seasoned ones, because they know better, where they mm -hmm. can look at this thing and say, yeah, I see an avenue back to either break even or profitability. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about some of your um, recent options and successes. Um, I know um, you've done a couple of blasts through, through my service, so I kind of wanted to just maybe get your thoughts on that and how you thought that went. Uh, your service is fantastic. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, no, it's it's terrific, and I, you know I was happy to use it. And um, actually, I had done you know speaking of rockets, I think that was the one that I had uh, uh, that I had pushed through the service. Mm -hmm. I, I think it was actually before all this came down, and the response was enormous. And mm -hmm. you know, did it again for uh, a script that I have called Midnight, which is a uh, sort of dark retelling of the uh, dark and uh, gothic retelling of the Cinderella story. It's based on the Brothers Grimm version, which is much darker and uh, hmm. more graphic and that actually led to um a non exclusive option. Um okay. I you know it was, it was a no money option so I I don't give away exclusives on no money so it was a non exclusive sure. option. But you know a terrific response there. Uh so that was fantastic. And uh you know then the other one that's you know still in development right now is is the end game which I, I met my producer on that through stage 32, which again, okay. I mean, if that isn't the biggest testimonial I can give, I don't know what is. Yeah, sure, um, sure. Yeah, uh, she brought the deal to Millennium Entertainment, which is the distribution on Millennium Films. We have a handshake deal there, uh, pending attachments. We're trying to be working with a casting director now and, and uh, with some people who are looking to put some development money into this thing to, to get those attachments necessary to make the deal and, and get Millennium in the spot to pre-sell the film. Mm -hmm. um, that happened all through stage 32. Great. Uh, so that's fun and exciting as well. And uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's like everything else, Ashley, as you know, you have to just keep, your options really are, are as limited as you make them. They're, you mm -hmm. know, with the advent of the internet and things like your service and, and, you know, being able to network for free on a site like stage 32 you know, uh, there's there's no room for excuses. There really isn't. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, there's sure. just a million different ways to get your work out there and to brand yourself, which is mm -hmm. another mistake I think writers make. I mean, you got to get out there and brand yourself and be visible. So, uh, yeah, I would recommend to anybody who has a script that is polished and is ready to go and has a clear log line and uh, you know, that you feel really confident about to, to look at Ashley's service because it's hey, thank you. perfect. Yeah. yeah, thank you. So, um, you know, is there some place that people can contact you? Is there a good way you're on Twitter or something? Um, if people have any questions or just want to network with you, is there some place they can, they can connect? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, when you sign up for Stage 32, you'll see my mug on your wall immediately. It's okay. the first post you see, and you'll see me Perfect. welcoming you to the community and telling you a little bit about it and giving you some helpful links to get started. And, of course, anybody can reach me through 
stage 32 just by, you know, uh, posting to me or, or shooting me a message or whatever. Uh, on Facebook, where, you know, I hate to say, again, I'm not a big proponent of Facebook, although for business, it's a little different, uh, mm-hmm. which is Facebook backslash stage 32. Okay. And on Twitter, I run our Twitter account. I also use it as my personal account, and that is uh, at stage 32 online, stage mm-hmm. 32 online. And, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm extremely accessible. I'm very, very visible on the site. I do try to respond to everybody. It's tough with over 200,000, you know, almost mm-hmm. 50,000 people on the site now, you know, to, but I do my best to, you know, get back to everybody and respond to everybody in, in a timely manner and, you know, help out mm-hmm. where I can always. Yeah. So uh, it's great. Um, I'll just pull back the curtain a little bit, um, and tell a quick story. You know, you and I met really, it's just, is a great example, I think, of, of networking. And I actually had a, a guest author on my blog and he was using your service. And you must have like a Google alert when someone Someone mentioned stage 32 or something, and you had actually read a couple of my blog posts, and then and then we just connected that way. So you know, just that's what I always preach to everybody. I mean, you're obviously the the. I would say the best example of this, I mean, you're a CEO, you've started a company and it's not only helping other writers, but it's also helping your own writers. So that's just inspiring, um, you know, and, and great to do. And, and to some degree, that's what I've ho- I'm hopefully doing with selling your screenplay dot com, too, is is I'm getting out there and creating a brand and a name for myself. Well, and and you are, and I mean, let me, you're being way too humble. I mean, real, really, before I started Stage 32, uh, and I was just writing, you were one of the blogs, you were a go-to destination for me, you know, every day to go and, mm-hmm. and read, not only to read what you were posting, but by the way, I mean, to go through the archives and look at some of the the uh, posts you had made about query letters and synopsis and log line. I mean, the, the variety and the wealth of information was incredibly helpful to me early on. And, yeah, thank you. Um, for that. Yeah, no, and I mean, I and you just do an incredible job. And and again, it's another illustrate. It it just illustrates again. The, I I think so many people feel like the industry right now that it's harder than ever. Things are worse than ever. And, it, and you know, every generation says that. You can go back and read things mm-hmm. even. You know, screenwriting, you go, go Google some screenwriting articles from the 80s and you'll see people talking about it. And this is when, you know, the late 80s when you started getting these million dollar scripts. Yeah. You know, two million, four million and everything like that. But people felt like it was so hard to break in. You know, to me, there are so many avenues now. You have so many ways to get your work out there. Distribution, the proliferation of distribution channels and, and network, uh, new networks, and new, I mean, you name it. I mean, it just mm-hmm. every day it seems like something else is coming online. You got Amazon going into original programming, Netflix going into, and it's just going to continue and continue and continue. There are a million opportunities out there, but even more than that, where we're at such an advantage over the, the screenwriting generation maybe that came before is that the amount of information that's out there on the internet, the amount of Good people like yourself who are taking the time to educate and to inform and to constantly be updating and provide material for, for writers is is just enormous. And mm-hmm. you know, if you're making excuses, you're you, like I said to somebody this morning. Actually, we're having this conversation. I go, look, I go. While you're making excuses, other people are going out and getting it done, and that's the mm-hmm. reality. I mean, the people that are really, really working it and working it hard. We had a screenwriter that actually posted on Stage Studio the other day. He got a film made with Open Road Productions. He'd been working forever. He just wrote an article for Script Magazine, too. Very, very well done. And and his whole point was that as bad as it got for me, as many times that I got beaten down or I thought that something good was going to happen or somebody told me they were interested and then disappeared on me or then came back and said, you know, nah, I'm not really interested, whatever. He goes, as down as I got... I never stopped working, and that's mm-hmm. the key. You can't stop. You got to do it every day. You got to be out there every day, even if you don't feel like writing that day. I'm not one of these people that has to say, "All right, we'll force out five pages." If you're not writing that day, go online and educate yourself a little bit more about what's going on in the business, what's selling. Mm-hmm. Go read a blog. You know, go mm-hmm. do something. Okay, but keep your mind stimulated and keep moving forward. When you lay your head down on the pillow that night, say to yourself, I accomplished something today, even if it's just gaining a little bit more knowledge. 
Mm -hmm. Just well said, well said. I mean, on that point, we'll end, but I couldn't agree more because that's what it's all about. It is just getting out there. Good things will happen to people who are just out there doing stuff and getting better and learning. Absolutely. Richard, I really appreciate it. You've been very generous with your time. Thank you for coming on. Um, it's just been a great. We've covered a lot of ground, so um, hopefully people will find this informative. I, I appreciate it, Ashley. Keep doing what you're doing. I, I love everything that you do, and, and this was a real pleasure and an honor for me. Thank you. Just a quick plug for an upcoming class that I'm running through Selling Your Screenplay. I'm bringing Alan Katz, who I interviewed in Episode 6 of the podcast, to teach a class on pitching. Every screenwriter needs to know how to pitch. Even if you're not doing formal pitching to producers, understanding how to pitch is an essential skill to have. Every meeting you ever have with a producer on some level is a pitch. Maybe it's you pitching your next project. Maybe you meet someone at a coffee shop and they ask you what you're working on. You'll need to be able to pitch. There are also a lot of these pitch fests out there that you can pay to go to, so this can help with that too. Alan is an experienced writer who sold many pitches, both in TV and the feature world. He was a producer and writer on HBO on the HBO series Tales from the Crypt, among many other projects. To learn more, go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash classes. In today's writing words section, I just wanted to build on something that Richard talked about. One of the things he mentioned is just how much opportunity really exists out there today. There are so many ways of marketing your material, it can seem a bit overwhelming. But one of the keys to marketing is trying a lot of different stuff and seeing what works for you. So go out there and try Stage 32, try Twitter, try Facebook, try all these various online services like My Blast Service and Ink Tip, and see what works for you. And then if you see some success with one method, really push hard in that direction. That's basically what you're seeing me do. I've had success with cold query letters, so I keep repeating that process over and over again. But I'm always trying new stuff, too. Different people will find success with different methods. It just depends on your personality, your skill set, and your talents. There is no one way that will work for everyone. I heard someone use this compass versus map metaphor the other day, which I think really is a good way to look at the advice that I and, and other screenwriting teachers give. Nothing that I or anyone else says should be looked at as a map to success. As I said, there is no such thing as one single map that's just going to work for everyone. It's not a map, but it can serve as a compass pointing you in the right direction. So hopefully that's how you're taking this advice. And hopefully today me and Richard have given you at least a little bit of wisdom that can keep you going in the right direction. Thanks for listening. That's our show.